Sometimes to answer a five second question takes days. Sometimes in murder trials, somebody will, you know, give a five second accusation. Did you murder this guy on, you know, 22nd Street? And it takes months or a year. Look at O.J. Simpson's trial. So for you morons that are trying to distract attention by saying, Hoven, why are you giving such a long answer to his 26 minute video? Well, his turn is next. He's welcome to take three years and pick my sentences apart. And then I'll go back through again. Or my suggestion would be, Mr. Nelson, you shut up right here. You lost. Keep quiet and go do something else. Okay. Aw, you thought you did well. That's cute. And by cute, I mean pathetic. How can you win a debate by getting all the facts wrong? I mean, every one of them that you somehow thought supported your case or countered mine. I only got one fact wrong myself. I said the Lepidosaurus had two chambered hearts. In fact, it's fish that have two chambered hearts. Lepidosaurus have three, and turtles actually have three and a half, which should be interesting. I should have known better. I knew better once. I should have double-checked rather than relying on memory, because as I said, I've forgotten more about this subject than you'll ever know. That one error doesn't affect the point either, since crocodilians, dinosaurs, and birds still have four-chambered hearts where your pseudoscience propaganda site told you a bunch of lies. So it's still impossible for lizards to grow up to be dinosaurs like you said they could, and it's rather obvious that birds are dinosaurs like I said they were. So admit in your next reply that I got that right. You got absolutely everything wrong because you had no idea what you were talking about at any point. You had to open a dictionary for every concept that came up, and I still had to explain the important parts that the dictionaries didn't cover. Now, why is that? It's because I have made a lifetime habit of avoiding this stuff to make it simple for people. to. I want people to understand, not to sit back and marvel. Whoa, he knew a big word. If you're too simple to understand any of this yourself, then how can you teach anyone else? Especially when you admit that you haven't done any study of this at all and consequently don't know any of the processes or relevant terms or concepts and you've repeatedly shown that you don't understand the evidence behind it. How can you have had over 150 debates and still not learn anything from any of those encounters? You'll learn from this one, I promise. And as for who won or lost, I counted all the upvotes on each video of your seven part response. I know you took one through four down for a time, so they had fewer upvotes than five, six, and seven, which stayed up the whole time. So I took the upvotes for those three, averaged them, and applied them to all seven to give you the most possible. As of December 9th, 2018, that's 4,037 votes for you. Then I added the upvotes on your seven videos that I mirrored on my channel, and that brought it up to 5,431 votes for you, which, let's be honest, that's more than you really earned. Then I counted all the upvotes on the six videos of my responses to you, and they added up to 17,400 votes for me. And to be fair, you only have about three-fifths as many subscribers as I do, so even if I only count three-fifths of my total, I still have twice as many upvotes as you do. And that's only if we're counting the first six videos in my response. You can add that to the number of upvotes you see on this seventh video that you're watching now. And clearly then, we have objective verification that I won this debate hands down and by a landslide. So you should shut up and be quiet. But of course you're not going to because by selling people on this scam, you've secured a retirement home on acres and acres of rural Alabama that you didn't have to earn either through work or study or accomplishment. That's a pretty good con job, much better than when you were pushing lethal poisons as a false cure for cancer. The hustle you're running now is much too sweet to lose it all by suddenly growing a conscience. Okay, but if you want to make comments, I will be glad to respond. That was the deal when we started. You make your speech, which is here. I interject my comments, which I'm doing. Then you go back and interject your comments, which you have yet to do. And I would suggest you just stop and not do it. But if you do, then I get to interject my comments for the final time. You get two cracks at it. I get two cracks at it. Then why have you posted what you admit here is only the first round, but since recording this, you posted two parts thus far of what is obviously only a second round, but you're calling that the third round already. I thought you said you were a math teacher once. Do you think one plus one equals three? And even though it can take years to educate you on evolution, especially when you're determined to misrepresent everything to make sure that you don't risk accepting it, we're not going to drag this out the way you want, wasting everyone's time such that there's never any progress or conclusion. No. I'm going to hold your feet to the fire and force you to be accountable. So I suggest that your second round of responses should be limited to no more than three videos, one for each of the facts presented to you that you failed to refute or understand. 
Or you could consolidate all into one video wherein you admit each of the points that I proved against you in my parts 5, 6, and 7. I'll give you one month, since I know your schedule allows you to make your casual videos much faster than I can make mine. Though, I don't see how you can respond to anything I've said in this debate other than to simply admit defeat on all points, which we already know you won't do no matter how obvious your failures in this exchange have been. So I predict that the official debate will probably end here, and you can go lick your wounds and make up whatever excuse you need to keep deceiving your minions so they'll keep building the, the free retirement estate that you didn't earn and don't deserve. So I asked him for his three best evidences for evolution. He said the first line of evidence is the fact that evolution happens. <laughs> go back and watch the tape. Not quite. Biodiversity and complexity increase naturally. I don't believe that for one second, Mr. Nelson. You don't have to believe it. You can prove it. And in fact, you already did. So in your reply, you should include some admission that evolution does in fact happen, that biodiversity does increase, just as you explained yourself when you contradicted yourself during the few seconds when you showed that you do believe that. Well, you're still arguing that evolution isn't what it is while ignoring what it is, but we'll fix that. You already admitted that what evolution really is, really happens. It's just your straw man fallacy of it that isn't real. Now variations certainly happen, but they have limits, and this is what you refuse to admit. They've been breeding for trying to get bigger pigs for a long time. Farmers keep trying to get bigger and bigger pigs. Do you think they'll ever get a pig as big as Texas where you live? No. I would say probably no. There is a limit, okay? Now you don't want to admit that, but yes, there is a limit. Thanks for admitting yet again that what evolution really is, really happens. In response, I would readily admit that there is a limit to physics, such that no animal could ever be as big as Texas, but that's not a limit for evolution, is it? And you can't show a limit to evolution. And roaches become resistant to pesticides. You spray them after a while, after a couple generations, they, they, the spray doesn't bother them. There are limits, though. They will never become resistant to a sledgehammer. I promise, okay? I don't know. There's some pretty impressive arthropods in the fossil record, some as big as you. Uh, some as size of alligators and heavily armored. But again, that's not a limit for evolution. Let's talk about God, Zilla. Even with all the effects of nuclear radiation on mutation, or what we used to believe about that in the 1950s, we could derive a reptile that looks like Godzilla, but not even God could make him 50 meters tall like the original movie said. That's taller than the largest dinosaur is long. And the new series has Godzilla standing 300 feet tall, and that's even more absurd. So you have to admit that your God has limits, because not even he could make a pig as big as Texas. And nor could he magically, excuse me, miraculously conjure the variety of suiforms that evolution can and obviously did do. Now, if only God could devise a mechanism that could produce that diversity for him, one with a self-correcting application like evolution has, now that would be a much more intelligent design. Here's a tiger had three different color cubs. They're still tiger. There are limits. They always produce the same kind, what anybody would consider the same kind. That's not really evolution. The information for that variety was already in the gene code. Notice they got tigers, they never got a blue one or a pink one or a red one. So you're admitting that your god can't make a blue tiger, nor a pink one, nor a red one? All we need to make tigers pink or red is a genetic condition called erythrism. They got colors that are already in the gene code. The new information is not, no new information is added. Yes, it is. New genetic information is produced by mutations, including changes in pigmentation of tigers. We know that. It has been proven. And according to this book on modern genetic analysis, two processes are responsible for genetic variation, recombination and mutation. Mutation is the ultimate source of genetic change. New alleles arise in all organisms, some spontaneously, others as a result of exposure to mutagenic agents in the environment. These new alleles become the raw material for a second level of variation affected by recombination. So yeah, new information is added by mutation. But that's just according to geneticists. <laughs> what do they know about genetics? Especially compared to you, an uneducated, willfully ignorant religious fanatic in backwoods Alabama talking out of the side of his blastopore. Sorry, no. If it's the word of a convicted fraud in a Hawaiian shirt against that of peer-reviewed science texts, then of course you're still the one who's wrong, and who's always been wrong all along. The dogs did not become pink or learn to fly. 
they're still dog. It might be useless like your dog or, you know, but it's, it's, it's still dog, sort of, okay? Are you admitting that your God can't make a dog that can fly? You know, in reality, evolution isn't like it is on the X-Men. Nothing ever gets superpowers. That's why even if Godzilla did exist, he still wouldn't have his inexplicable breath weapon. Now, some things are not possible either for evolution or your God. And the gene pool of the new variety is always more limited. This is from my seminar part four. Uh, Chihuahuas cannot produce Great Danes. Their gene pool is limited. Then how were ranchers able to produce gigantic cows like this one, six foot four inches at the shoulder and one and a half tons on the hoof? After thousands of years of cattle breeding, this gene pool must have reached its limit by now, right? Yet this is substantially bigger than the archetypal aurochs that all Western cattle has bred from. This is bigger than any cattle breed ever. And since you constantly equate bigger with better and new information, then you got to admit this definitely counts, even according to your own criteria. So once again, you've made an empty assertion presented without citation because it's supported by nothing but your own imagination. It's blind, baseless speculation, and that's why it's not just worthless, it's completely false. And that's why you can't, in your next reply, show any actual science to back up your lies. Pretending to know things that you don't know and asserting facts that are not facts is lying. And that's all your ministry is based on. The gene pool of the new variety is not more limited. And by taking advantage of selected mutations, we could easily eventually breed chihuahuas back into dogs even bigger than the Great Dane. I come from Illinois, corn country. There are hundreds of varieties of corn. They have to number them. But when you get a variety or a strain of corn, it's still corn. And it's always weaker in almost every other area except for the one trait they're looking for. Maybe it's uh, more disease resistance or maybe it's more drought resistant, whatever their area is. They raise corn for to stand more water or to withstand insect floods or whatever <clears throat> or to grow bigger but it's always corn you're never going to get a whale or a hamster or a tomato to grow on your corn stalk there are limits and you guys either can't understand it or won't admit it since no textbook and no science lesson ever taught anything as stupid as what you just suggested then maybe you shouldn't say that that's what evolution teaches because that's obviously wrong and you're lying again Lying is still immoral, even if your ministry demands it. So, rather than assume that not knowing anything means you somehow know more than all the world's best educated expert specialists anywhere ever, maybe you should consider this thought that has obviously never crossed your deluded mind. If the entire global scientific community, all the best and brightest thinkers of every relevant field of study around the world agree and accept that evolution does and did happen, then you should ask yourself, what do they know that you don't? Because in this case, the answer is everything. You don't even know what evolution is. You're a laughable ignoramus with no education, no idea what you're talking about, and no science to back you up. So quit pretending that you're some kind of authority. There are 339 recognized breeds of dogs in America, in the American Kennel Association. They're always going to produce a dog, and they all came from dogs. But as I explained to you earlier, dogs, foxes, and other canids came from another canid. Canids, bears, and other caniforms came from another caniform. Caniforms and feliforms both came from an earlier carnivoran, and so on. These are all clades within clades. At no point did any of them ever become a different kind than their ancestors were, like you keep pretending. You don't know what you're talking about. That's why you're always wrong about everything. B uh, BBC, looks like 95% of current dogs came from just three original founding females. I think it was probably maybe one, but still, they got the right concept. Sure, dogs produce a variety, but they're limited. Today's dogs come in all shapes and sizes, but scientists believe they evolved from just a handful of wolves tamed by humans 15,000 years ago. They're getting close. Keep studying. Pretty soon you can be independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical, chicken-eating Baptist if you keep studying, okay? If they've already studied all of this well enough to have achieved accredited doctorate degrees in their field of expertise, and you've never studied any of this enough to know what the subject is, and you can't even think logically or rationally, then I think what you meant is that they'll be like you if they suffer brain damage significant enough to cause both amnesia and dementia. I don't know what causes the Dunning-Kruger effect to be so exacerbated by your narcissism, but it obviously is an academic study. They talk about, this Irish textbook talks about diverge. I am wound up tonight, man. i got to get this covered. I've been studying this, and I said, makes me mad that he teaches what he does, so I'll be sweet and kind and go fast. Okay. 
Divergent evolution, this Irish textbook says. Don't give it a fancy name, it's still a dog. Oh yes, look boys and girls, the poodle, the Dalmatian, the terrier all came from a common... It's still a dog. It's not divergent evolution. This textbook says we have divergent evolution because on opposite sides of the Grand Canyon, there are two different kinds of squirrels. Whoa. Okay. Let's see. We have the Kaibab squirrel on one side and the Abert squirrel on the other side. This proves we all came from a rock. In their, in their mind, that's all you need. Man, it has got to be hard finding people dumb enough to believe you. I have to wonder when the other folks in the room with you are going to notice that all these textbooks are teaching what evolution really is and that your objection to that is that they're not teaching the fallacious straw man distortion of what you want to pretend that evolution is. It's time to give that up because your lies are not in any of the textbooks. You have to address or accept what evolution really is. There's a whole bunch of varieties of squirrels and you squirrel hunters. I'd like to get one of every single kind to put in our museum here, stuffed and mounted. That'd be cool. There's a variety of horses. And this Mexican textbook says, the zebra and the horse had a common ancestor. I would agree that's probably true. And it looked like a horse, you know, four wheel drive, leather upholstery. It was a horse kind of animal. No, it wasn't. The earliest equines from the Oligocene epoch were smaller than donkeys and still had three toes on each foot, where all of today's equines have only one, the middle toe. Intermediate fossils still had vestigial toes on either side that didn't touch the ground anymore. Since all mammals evolved from a five-fingered forefather, then of course earlier paracidactyls had more toes. The Eocene Hyracotherium is the earliest known apparent ancestor of horses, as tiny as the smallest pony. It already had three toes on its hind feet, but four toes on its front feet. This clade, Perissodactyla, includes more than just horses. Surviving species include rhinos and tapirs and a number of other interesting fossil species too. Calicotheres, for example. They were like full-sized horses, but still with three toes on each foot, and whose hooves were shaped like huge claws. It looks like a horse, but probably lived and ate more like a giant sloth. So is this part of your mythical horse kind? There are miniature horses today, 30 inches tall. We had one of the world's smallest horses come visit Dinosaur Adventure Land. My granddaughter, she's now 17 years old, I was trying to sit on the horse, she's four weeks old there. That was a tiny horse. It's still a horse. It could be horses, zebras, asses, all had a common ancestor. They crossbreed them all sorts of ways. They get zorses, zonkeys, zeonies, zedonks, zebras, shebras. Most of them are sterile, but the fact that they can cross at all probably indicates they're the same kind. I bet you could not cross a horse and a cow, or a horse and a giraffe, or a horse and a hamster. There are limits. Why can't they admit that? This article in Science World describes another early Eocene species, very similar to Arachitherium, as also being potentially basal to both horses and rhinos. Though without a complete skeleton, it's hard to be sure. Because the radiation of eutherians from common forms is such that many early Eocene mammals are so closely related, they're hard to tell apart. The law of biodiversity says that the further back in time you look, the simpler and more similar living things appear to be, because they're more closely related which goes completely against the ridiculous idea of hamsters growing on corn stalks and so on. And that means that going forward, species start out the same and become more and more diverse through the accumulation of incremental, usually subtle, superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities in every descendant lineage at once. So if we play the Sesame Street game with your horse, hamster, cow, and giraffe, then the closest relationship these have is that they're all Boreotherian mammals. This is one of the earliest divisions among placentals. On the other side, Atlanta Genata, we have Afrotheria, which is elephants, aardvarks, and sirenians, and Xenarthra, which is sloths, anteaters, and armadillos. Now, these trees are constructed on shared physical and genetic traits, including genetic defects. Now, there's an intelligent design. And according to this study of the largest available molecular data set for placental mammals published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, all these were the same thing roughly 98 million years ago. We can eliminate the hamster first, as it is the only Euarchontoglyer like we are. The rest are Laurasiotherian, and more specifically, Euangulata. According to the molecular clock, these diverged an estimated 78 million years ago. And the ancestor of all these superficially resembled a small capybara, except that its claws had thickened into hooves. 69 million years ago, such an early hooved herbivore 
with at least four toes on each foot, diversified into parasodactyls, which is rhinos and horses on the one side of the family tree, and led to cloven-hooved artiodactyls on the other. Cattle and giraffes are both ruminants, having stomachs that are divided into multiple chambers. So we jump several more clades and millions of years forward, ignoring an awful lot of fossil species you've never heard of, to get to when what would become giraffes could still breed with what would become cattle. The ancestors of both looked a bit like goats and were actually closely related to goats. So over the last 80 million years or so, each lineage grew apart, becoming markedly different from each other. But individually, they actually changed very little over all that time. And at no point, here or anywhere in evolutionary history, did any of these things become a different kind than its ancestors were. In fact, if you could watch this whole sequence, you would say that they're all the same kind. So here's an important question I need you to answer. If you imagine some limit to the evolution I described here, then what is that limit? Because I don't think you know. And I think you know you don't know, that you're just making it up. Stripeless zebra baffles the experts. <clears throat> a Zetland zoni, the result of breeding a female Shetland pony to a male zebra. They're still four-wheel drive, you know, leather upholstery. It's still in the horse kind. Is it a zonkey or a zebra? We don't know. We can't figure it out. Here's a herd of zebroids running around. Still the same kind of animal. You know, in the last hundred years, the Kentucky Derby up in Kentucky, they've been, the winning speed went from an average of 127 seconds down to 123 seconds. Now, even in the old days, they got some really good times. I mean, really good times in the old days, in the 20s and 30s. Question, how much money would you guess has been spent on selective breeding trying to get a faster horse for the Kentucky Derby? Hundreds of millions, hundreds of, millions of dollars. Why don't they breed wings on the horse and fly around the track in 12 seconds? <laughs> because that's obviously not the way evolution works. In my falsifying phylogeny video series, I explain that everything creationists demand to see, that they say would, should be evidence of evolution, would actually violate one or more laws of evolution. And the first example I give is that the discovery of a pegasus is one of the things that would disprove evolution. Y'all certainly are predictable. It seems that your ability, or rather refusal, to understand this very simple concept must be deliberate. That's why you have to lie about evolution, ignoring what it is to pretend it's something else, because you're afraid that if you understand it, you'll accept it. Indeed, every Christian who can demonstrate an adequate understanding of evolution also accepts that evolution is the mechanism by which the earth brings forth after their kind. They got leopons now, <clears throat> cross between a lion and a leopard, it's still in the cat family. They got tigons and ligers. <clears throat> How many kinds of cows are there in the world? Gee whiz, there's some for more beef, some for more uh, milk, some to withstand the heat better. There's a cross between a buffalo and a bison, uh, or domestic beefalo cow. Well, maybe the buffalo and the cow are the same original created kind. There is no original created kind. There aren't just different breeds of cattle either. There are many different species too, extant and extinct, and these are obviously closely related to sheep and deer and giraffes and other ruminants. Somebody crossed a sheep and a goat. <clears throat> Got a geep. <laughs> they crossed a, a killer, false killer whale with a dolphin and got a walpin. Okay, they still swim in the water. Try to cross your walpin with a cow, okay, or an elephant. Just, there's a, a camma, which is a result of a llama and a camel. Well, maybe that's original, same kind of animal, close enough to breed. No, they're not. But it's interesting that you admit that some species can be close enough to breed or too far apart to still do that. Otherwise, I've noticed that creationists tend to get evolution completely backwards, thinking that you hybridize two species to get a third. But what really happens is that one species eventually becomes two distinct ones, and the divergence only continues from there to 4, 8, 16, and so on, except the ones that die off. And there are stages of separation I need to explain here. When a population is genetically isolated for a few generations, they'll accrue enough unique mutations that you can tell the two groups apart. If they meet, they may interbreed and produce something that looks like the original ancestral stock. Or, if they've diverged into a number of distinct subspecies already and only two of them meet, then it would look like a hybrid of those two. If more time elapses and they grow further apart before they meet and mate, then there would be enough unique mutations built up as to reduce the chance of producing fertile offspring. If even more time elapses, more generations between them, then there will be so much genotypic and phenotypic variance that they may not be able to produce viable offspring if they try to mate at all. 
generations after that, and they're not even physically compatible anymore. That's where llamas and camels are. They're clearly related, even though camels have new information that llamas don't, being their definitive humps. But they've grown so far apart that they can only be hybridized with surgical removal and replacement of artificially inseminated egg. Llamas and camels cannot bring forth without human intervention and laboratory assistance. And that makes sense for a hybrid of two different genera, but it wouldn't be possible if they were magically created unrelated to anything else. There's a jag lion cross between a jaguar and a lion. How about a bobcat lynx cross? I got a magazine where you can order chickens. You know, there are over 30 varieties of chickens you can get. And it says right here, jungle fowl are the original bird from which all varieties and strains of domesticated chickens are arrived, derived. Did you know all the chickens had a common ancestor? Anybody want to guess what it was? Uh, a frog. A frog. Come on, man. We... <laughs> there are eight varieties of bears in the world. We got the display out here in our museum. Eight kinds of bears. Black bear, brown bear, grizzly bear, panda bear, you know, sun bear, polar bear. They might have had a common ancestor called a bear. There are many more varieties of terriers than there are bears, and they all had a common ancestor, a terrier, which by your logic was magically created separate from hounds and mastiffs and is not even related to other dogs, as if God created two terriers and Noah had two terriers on board his ark. When you know that terriers are a subset of dogs and that dogs are a subset of an even larger clade, but you're going to deny this. Why? Because you're irrational and you refuse to understand even simple concepts that ruin your preferred delusion. Mr. Nelson, you cannot prove anything about evolution that we've been discussing. I proved that evolution never taught that we came from a rock, nor that we came from nothing. I proved that new genetic information really does come from mutations, and I proved that evolution doesn't even allow for any change of clades, and that there's no such thing as a kind, which is your single biggest flaw in your whole erroneous position, and constitutes the only limit you could think of, but that obviously doesn't really exist. I also proved in another series of videos that the global flood of Noah never happened, and you have to ignore or deny all of that as a matter of faith, pretending that no one knows better so that you can make believe something that evidently isn't real. You're wholly committed to an irrational delusion, defended only by illogical assertions, where I am free to change my mind if you could just show me good reason. But you don't know how to reason. Now, his third line of evidence. I'm going to play, I know it's going to be difficult, 45 seconds straight without interruption of Mr. Nelson starting at 2222 here. Where is he right here? Let's see. We gotta get it over there. What's going on here? Why isn't it working? Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Right there. Birds are a subset of dinosaurs in the same way that humans are a subset of apes, primates, eutherian mammals, and <coughs> deuterostome animals. There's no faith required in any of this. We can prove it all. And my third line of evidence supporting evolution is that we don't just have a mechanism that we know actually works even under direct observation and manipulation if we want to. And we don't just have a phylogeny that we can verify with fossils, morphology, physiology, embryology, and genetics. We also have an actual theory, something creationism doesn't have and can't even comprehend. A body of knowledge with profound explanative power that has withstood more and harsher critical analysis than any other theory, and yet it still has never failed or been contradicted. If you're going to disprove or refute any scientific theory, much less the best supported theory in all of science, you're going to have to cough up your own theory to replace it. That's one of the rules of science. To qualify, your hypothesis will have to be effectively proven in the sense that it has to make testable predictions that are potentially falsifiable, and it has to account for all the data better than the current theory. We'll stop there for now because we're getting a... It's going to get way too deep to shovel if we don't. <clears throat> okay. First, people get a BS. We know what that is. Then they get MS. That's more of the same. And then PhD is piled higher and deeper. Okay. So <clears throat> let me take this line at a time, Mr. Nelson. My third line of evidence supporting evolution is that we don't just have a mechanism that we know actually works. That is absolute baloney. What is the mechanism that changes a hamster to an elephant over billions of years? You're misrepresenting it again. Hamsters are rodents, a subgroup of boreutherian mammals, so we know they didn't grow on corn stalks like you suggested earlier. 
whereas elephants are in Atlanta Genata. Both are modern mammals and neither one evolved from the other. If you want to challenge evolution, try to inquire about something that evolution actually teaches instead of making up your own desperate distortions of every reality you don't want to understand or accept. Or changes um, an amoeba to a whale. What is that mechanism? I would like to see that. Religion. Where's the new information coming in in the gene code? You do not have a mechanism that you know works. You imagine it, you dream about it. Oh, oh, hang on. Under direct observation and manipulation if we want to. No, you don't have that. Why would you say such a thing? <laughs> because it's true and you've already explained it yourself. You just don't understand how far it goes because you're trying to deny that new genetic information is contributed by mutations, which we know it is. We have substantial proof of that. And you refuse to understand anything about genetic markers or fossil indicators, which is pretty bad for somebody trying to build a dinosaur adventure land by ignoring or distorting everything that made dinosaurs interesting. And we don't just have a phylogeny that we can verify with fossils, morphology, physiology, embryology, and genetics. We also have an actual theory. Whoa. Well, let's see. Let's take this line at a time, word at a time. Phylogeny. A proposal of how organisms are related by their evolutionary history. So they arrange them and draw lines on paper and that becomes evidence. It is based on the evidence that all living things are related by common descent. So your trees are based, your phylogeny trees are based on the evidence that they're related by common descent. That's imagination. No, 06452017, by your own admission. Your belief is based on imagination, mine is not. The taxonomic categories to which humans and all other species belong are objectively determinable by physical characteristics. We are apes, primates, eutherian mammals, and a host of other taxa, just like I said, without drawing any lines on any paper. And computerized genetic confirmation is an objective verification without any imagination in the equation. Stop lying about this. Everyone, even the people in the room with you, can see that that's what you're doing. The evidence for phylogeny comes from, and it names a bunch more sciences. Well, let's talk about these. He said, we also uh, don't just have a phylogeny. We can verify with fossils. Look, no fossil counts as evidence of anything other than it died. In a court of law with an honest judge and an intelligent jury, they would throw out every single fossil as evidence for evolution. Every one. No, they wouldn't, and the reason they wouldn't is because science operates by making predictions and testing these with falsifiable experiments or further discoveries. Predicted fossils then meet the criteria for evidence, even in a court of law, because evidence is a body of objectively verifiable facts that are positively indicative of or exclusively concordant with one available position over any other. As such, fossils cannot be dismissed the way you desperately wish that they could be. He said morphology. What is that? Morphology is the shape of organs and features that you have, the study of forms. How many animals have two eyes? Or nearly all of them. Okay. My third line of evidence comes from physiology. What is that? The branch of biology that deals with normal functions of living organisms and their parts, the way in which a living organism or bodily part functions. So you're telling me the way things function, like your stomach digests food and your lungs exchange gases, that is proof for evolution. Couldn't that be, you know, proof of creation? Yep. Absolutely. Of course not. In this context, proof is an overwhelming preponderance of evidence. We have a mechanism to show that evolution is not only possible, but is currently happening. And we have substantial evidence in numerous fields of study to prove that it happened quite a lot in the past, too, continuously. We have volumes of evidence indicating the common ancestry of all life forms, showing that any given trait should qualify as a derived synapomorphy. So the physiology in question matches the prevailing theory. On the other hand, we have absolutely nothing whatsoever to imply that creation is even possible, and quite a lot to show that it is entirely fraudulent. But even if creationism was a credible alternative, there is nothing about any biological trait that is either inconsistent with evolution or that in any way implies a magical, excuse me, supernatural creation. The same fact cannot be evidence of two different mutually exclusive conclusions at the same time. If the same fact is consistent with the predictions of either position, then it isn't evidence of either one. It's just a fact. It doesn't become evidence until it indicates one or eliminates the other. And the idea that a god miracled up an illusion designed to look exactly as if everything evolved does not allow you to misappropriate the evidence for evolution. 
Also comes from embryology. I cannot believe you are still using this. You just throw out the word hoping nobody will catch it. Slow down. Embryology, an embryo, the baby growing in the mother, the branch of biology and medicine concerned with the development of embryos in their development. On my video number four of my series, creation seminar series, go to video number four, <clears throat> lies in the textbooks. I cover quite a bit. I'm going to show just a small piece of it here about lies in the text before you can buy it individually. 50 bucks for the whole thing. That's a lie to say embryology supports evolution. Here's a textbook, Heath Biology, right over there. They say we have evidence of evolution from development. They're lying through their teeth here. The similarity between early stages in development helped convince Darwin that many forms of life shared common ancestors. Whoa, now that's simply crazy. Darwin considered this by far the single, strongest single class of facts in favor of his theory. So when Darwin thought this idea that all the embryos look alike is the strongest evidence for his theory, it's not true. And you know that. I mean, surprised, Mr. Nelson, that you would say embryology is evidence for evolution. This was proven wrong in 1874. Maybe you need, you got two years of college, I know you have your associate's degree, maybe keep going and you might learn about that, okay? Since my associate's of science degree counts for all the accredited formal education you and I have between us, then I'm still the only one who knows the subject well enough to speak on it. So I'll teach you another lesson that you should already know on your own, but you obviously don't. The early days of comparative embryology had two pioneers, but only one with significant formal training. Ernst Haeckel was primarily an artist who became famous as a science communicator, and he had an unrealistically simplistic view of evolution when he proposed that mammalian embryos actually become fish, then amphibians, then reptiles, passing through each of their adult stages as they develop. Of course, his biogenetic law was finally disproved by 1910, not 1874. Carl Ernst von Baer was a serious biologist and professor of zoology. He had already proposed a law that was very similar to Haeckel's biogenetic law, but with one important difference. Von Baer noticed that mammalian embryos never resemble the adult stages of whatever was then considered to be less evolved forms, but that the embryo nonetheless did resemble the embryonic stages of those lower forms. This slight but important difference meant that his law was never disproved. Had Haeckel not specified the adult stages of fish, amphibian, and reptile ranks, then we might still be saying that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny today, because they actually do reflect evolutionary development, but only at the embryonic stage. This textbook shows the embryo having gills like a fish, folds of skin. Those are not gills. This is lie number 11 in my video series, uh, lies in the textbooks. Those little folds of skin develop into glands in the throat, and uh, mostly glands in the throat and bones in the ear. They never have anything to do with breathing, never. They're little folds of skin. They grow into different, not, nothing to do with breathing. I've seen fat folks that have five or six chins. They can't breathe through any of them but the top one. <laughs> the fish we evolved from already had lungs and gills and they relied on their lungs, which is how gills became unnecessary. The reason they lost their gills was because they already had nothing to do with breathing. So the developing fetus reabsorbs these pharyngeal clefts to produce other things instead, things those ancient fish didn't have. Now these, there's a human embryo and a dog embryo at four weeks. At four weeks development, you can see vast differences. Haeckel made them look exactly alike. Now keep in mind, this was in 1869, when not many folks had microscopes, certainly not good microscopes, didn't have access to one there. So he got by with it for a long time. In the first edition of his best-selling book, Natural History of Creation, Haeckel used the same image to represent the embryos of dogs, chickens, and turtles. When a reviewer alerted him to this, he said that no one could tell the difference at that stage, which was probably true given the instrumentation of the time. But this confession, that any of his drawings were admittedly without reference, has disgraced Haeckel's name in the annals of science, despite the fact that these were corrected in later editions. It also heightens scientific scrutiny from then on. Scientists should never believe anything that hasn't been vetted and verified, so you'd better be able to show that you're right about what you say, which is why no one takes you seriously. Creation Magazine, back in 96, ran an article showing the 
actual photographs compared to his drawings. Here is the chart that Haeckel made showing how that all these animals, the humans, the fish, the chicken, all of them, the pig, all look identical as embryos. He lied through his teeth. On top are his drawings. Underneath are actual photographs of what he claimed he's drawing a picture of. This is the real thing. That's the picture he came out with. He's either an incredibly lousy artist or he's lying. Well, we now know he was a fabulous artist and he was lying. The charge was that Heckel embellished these drawings to imply more resemblance than there was, this based on computerized critique of his artistic skill. However, it has been shown that this same analysis would also indict Heckel's enemy contemporaries on the same charge, as well as modern embryologists too. A later paper titled Heckel's Embryos, Fraud Not Proven, written by Robert Richards and published in his journal Biology and Philosophy in 2009, offers a compelling rebuttal to the charges detailed in the 1997 science article. The historical and biological evidence, however, shows the charge against Haeckel to be logically mischievous, historically naive, and founded on highly misleading photography. The images under scrutiny were taken from Haeckel's hastily assembled first edition of Anthropogeny. However, each of the subsequent editions had the advantage of better instrumentation and the accuracy of the drawings improved, but there was nothing wrong with those original images to begin with. The damning microphotographs published by Michael Robertson in 1997 showed these embryos with yolk and other maternal material that made them look very different. That and the chicken was photographed with a different angle with a different lens effect than the others, while the salamander was a different size. Haeckel clearly indicated that his drawings were only of the embryos omitting things like yolk and that he made them all the same size and oriented the same way for ease of comparison, so he did nothing wrong here. Robertson, the very researcher who indicted Heckel in 1997, seems to have softened his view since then, perhaps after his own errors in the indictment itself were brought to light. In a November 2002 paper published in the Biological Reviews of Cambridge Philosophical Society titled Heckel's ABC of Evolution and Development, Robertson writes, Heckel's much criticized embryo drawings are important as phylogenetic hypotheses, teaching aids, and evidence of evolution. While some criticisms of the drawings are legitimate, Others are more tendentious. So, no, Heckel was not lying about that. Despite its status as a fake, Darwin continued to use the biogenetic law as the most important evidence of common descent. No, he didn't. Heckel's drawings didn't even exist until years after Darwin's final publication. Darwin referred to real embryos with guidance from von Baer, not Heckel. Darwin accurately depicted the resemblance of closely related embryos and never suggested that they progress through the adult stages of their evolutionary lineage. His book, On the Origin of Species, never cited Heckel's Law. So, 06452017, I challenge you to defend yet another of your false accusations. And, Mr. Nelson, I, you should be embarrassed that you are still using embryology in 2018 when this was proven wrong in 1874. Far from being disproved, modern embryology does recognize numerous connections between ontogeny and phylogeny and explains them using evolutionary theory without recourse to Heckel's specific view. Even more so now. Within the last decade or so, comparing evolutionary development with embryological development has become a new field of biology affectionately known as evo-devo. Evo-devo can also be expressed as a law when von Baer noted that the more closely related any two species are, the more similar their development, and I would add that the young of two closely related species look more alike than the adults do. And there are numerous examples of evolutionary evidence in embryology. For one, the different types of dinosaur feathers in the fossil record follow the same pattern as the stages of feather formation in a chicken embryo, and this has been connected to the exact genes for this, too. Another example is found in crustaceans. Although adult crabs look quite a bit different than lobsters or shrimp in that they don't have tails, we see that crab nymphs or zoya actually do have tails and that these fold into the carapace of mature crabs, leaving only a vestigial crease indicating where the tail was. Even that follows von Baer's law that we now call Evo Devo. For another example, glass snakes and whales both have four legs in embryo. The whale reabsorbs the hind leg buds while the lizard absorbs all four buds. Arm buds are virtually indistinguishable at formation, but might become a wing, an arm, a leg, or a flipper. Pig embryos also have their fingers looking more like hands before they close into the hoof shape. Each of these follows an evolutionary pattern, so comparative embryology was always valid and substantial evidence supporting evolution. This is uh, Ke Kenneth Miller, teaches at Rhode Island. We tried and tried to get a debate with him, and Kenneth, 
anytime. 855 Big Dino Extension 3. I'll come up to your university and take on all your staff with half my brain tied behind my back. I can't believe you are still lying to your students, telling them embryology is evidence for evolution. You're either confused or you're deliberately lying. I don't know of another way to put it. Well, since you've been proven to be wrong and or inexcusably ignorant about everything you've alleged so far, then why not consider that instead of all the experts collectively being wrong about their area of specialty that you don't know anything about, that maybe you're the one who's wrong again, or should I say still, like you have been all through this debate and throughout your career. The reason the entire global scientific community disagrees with you is not because you know better than everyone else about things you've never studied. You don't even know how much you don't know. You're like a child walking into an obstetrician's office commanding them to teach the stork theory because you don't believe in pregnancy. My third line of evidence supporting evolution is that we don't just have a mechanism, we also have an actual theory. <laughs> We also have an actual theory, something creationism doesn't have and can't even comprehend. Excuse me, Mr. Nelson. I may have to look up some of the giant words you use because you're trying to impress people. I'm trying to teach things at a simple level, and most people appreciate that. But we do have a theory. It's been in printed form for many thousands of years and has never been proven wrong. You see, the Bible is actually the anvil that has worn out many hammers. Here is the Bible. Here is Mr. Nelson. You can keep beating on it all day long. You're going to be worn out and not it. And at Judgment Day, you're going to be really embarrassed. You finally come to the empty threat that follows every failed argument for faith against science. Baseless, unsupported speculation does not a theory make. You have to start with a hypothesis, one that is based on evidence and is testable and falsifiable and that offers some explanation of how things work. Your Bible doesn't work for many reasons, not the least of which being you know, the requirement of faith, and that magic is not an explanation of anything. It's an excuse for not having an explanation, nor wanting to know what is really true. The Bible is a repugnant tome full of nothing but absurdities, atrocities, inconsistencies, and contradictions. It's not just wrong scientifically and historically, it's wrong ethically and morally. The reason that the Bible is absolutely wrong about absolutely everything is because it was written by ignorant and bigoted superstitious savages who believed in magic and thought that the world was flat. Everything the Bible says about the nature of the earth in relation to the rest of the cosmos is laughably wrong. But that's beside the point here, because quite a few Christians, especially educated Christians, agree with me that the Bible should only be read metaphorically and that evolution is an indisputable fact of phylogeny. A body of knowledge with profound explanatory, explanative power that has withstood more and harsher critical analysis than any other theory, and yet it still has never failed or been contradicted. You're claiming that evolution is a body of knowledge that's never been contradicted. That's correct. And time for another necessary lesson in history. In the 1700s, a number of scientists were determined to believe that the reason things burned was because of a mysterious substance called phlogiston that was thought to exist inside anything flammable. Then Antoine Laurent Lavoisier performed a series of experiments disproving phlogiston theory and replacing that with his own theory of oxygen. And since then, the criteria to become a theory has gotten more strict. Now, before any hypothesis may be elevated to the level of theory, it has to be effectively proven by withstanding a prolonged and substantial battery of tests in peer review. This stricter criteria is the reason why no scientific theory has been disproved in more than a hundred years. If evolution ever had been contradicted by science, it would not be the backbone of modern biology that it is now. And this article from the National Academy of Science says that evolution is both a fact and a theory. It also explains that a theory is a comprehensive explanation of some aspect of nature that is supported by a vast body of evidence. And that's why creationism will never have a theory. Creationism meets exactly none of the criteria required of a scientific theory. And once again, we see that your sacred fables and your unsupported pseudoscience apologists don't cut it because they're not supported by evidence, don't explain anything, and can't be tested or falsified. The very first thing you need is to show that what you believe is really real and not just make-believe like you already admitted that it is. So you got nothing. You got no evidence, no way to test your assertions, and you refuse to ever accept when they fail, which is all they do. And your fairy tale doesn't explain anything either. Creationism is an absolute failure that cannot be defended honestly. Anyone defending creationism has to lie or they have to give up. Excuse me, Mr. Nelson, okay? We gotta define what we're talking about. 
Once again, I'm using the real definition of evolution. The scientific theory of biodiversity via population mechanics, summarily defined as descent with inherent genetic modification. And paraphrased for clarity, it is the process of varying allele frequencies among reproductive populations leading to usually subtle changes in their morphological or physiological composition of descended subsets. When compiled over successive generations, these can expand biodiversity when continuing variation between genetically isolated groups eventually lead to one or more descendant branches increasingly distinct from their ancestors or cousins. And this is what you would call microevolution. But of course, the same definition applies to macroevolution too. And I've already shown that speciation is part of macroevolution and micro and macro are the same theory, whether you're ready to admit that truth or not. Such structures, which are considered to be an evidence of an organism's evolutionary, ev organism, evolutionary past are called vestigial structures. For example, the hind limbs of whales are vestigial. There are no vestigial structures. Even if there were, that's the opposite of evolution. That's losing, not gaining. You've negated the definition because vestigial always means something you would categorize as losing. But of course, vestigial traits are proof that evolution can gain or lose and doesn't have to adhere to your criteria. You also said vestigial means you don't need it anymore, but that's not true. It means a trait that has either lost or diminished its original function and may have been adapted for a new one. For example, the wings of a penguin being adapted as flippers. It serves a valuable purpose, but you know that before they used it as a flipper, it used to be a wing. That's a vestige of having once been flying birds. And speaking of bird wings, if you want to see a vestigial trait that really is useless and strong evidence for evolution at the same time, this was my pet emu. I loved that bird. This photo was taken down the street from my house. Uh, emus don't have wings. Instead, they have tiny arms, just like a Tyrannosaurus, except that emu arms have only one finger, and on the end of that finger is a claw. Now, that is definitely a vestige from its dinosaur ancestry, and it's completely useless, because emus have lost the musculature to move their arms. So there's a claw on an arm that no bird should have that proves it's a dromaeosaur, and that claw can't do anything. So in your response, if you dare make a response, I demand that you admit this vestigial trait because you can't dismiss or refute it. Is this how whales evolved? From a cow to a whale. A whale can give 2,000 pounds of milk in one day. Utterly ridiculous. <laughs> they say the reason why is because whales have a vestigial pelvis right there. A vestigial pelvis and leg bone that serve no purpose. These structures are evidence of the whale's evolution from four-legged land-dwelling mammals. That biology book's right over there, I believe. Modern whales have hind limbs, <clears throat> which have been reduced to only a few tiny internal hind limb bones that have no function. You've got to be kidding. Who wrote this book? Just imagine whales walking around. It's true. They're talking about these bones right there. Just imagine the whale walking around. I I, I can't imagine. I tried. Even though you know of earlier whales that still had limbs they could walk on, somehow you can't imagine them walking? Millions of years ago, dolphins had legs. Oh, really? Why? Because of those little hind leg bones. And the occasional atavism where a previously dormant gene for pelvic flippers gets turned on again. And of course, earlier fossils showing actual legs, so we know their pelvis was then used for its primary function. Now listen, you guys that did all this, uh, teaching this baloney, those little bones are not vertebral, not evidence for evolution. The whale's pelvis, located far from the vertebra, has no apparent function. Well, there's the bone they're talking about right there. It is part of the whale's reproductive system. Remember, whales have to mate in the dark, underwater, with no arms, and they can't talk, and so he scored over, honey. This has nothing whatsoever to do with walking on land. It has to do with making baby whales. Why would they teach the kids this is vestigial? Because even if the pelvis could be appropriated for reproductive purposes, that's still not its original function. We know these guys used to have legs. And likewise, snakes. Snakes are a subset of lizards, and they used to have legs. And when Cretaceous snake had all four legs, but they were too small to walk on. Others from that era only had hind legs, but they were so tiny, they were absolutely useless. And you can't argue otherwise because no snakes have legs at all anymore. So we know this happens. There's a precedent for it. And besides, it's losing, not gaining, remember? You keep repeating the double standard fallacy to suit your argument. 
You complained at one point in this debate that the number of chromosomes mattered when bears have four fewer chromosomes than dogs, but for whatever reason, you don't care if one group of seals has four more chromosomes than other seals. And it didn't bother you at all that one species of butterfly might have 248 more chromosomes than another species of butterfly. All your arguments are dishonest, and they indicate that you know as well as I do what we would both see if we stepped into a TARDIS and jumped back in time a hundred million years. You know, it's possible to look at the evidence and come to the wrong conclusion. And you atheists are so anxious to get God out of your life that you look at the evidence and everything you see becomes evidence for evolution. Once again, what you've just repeated is the very first foundational falsehood of creationism, the false dichotomy fallacy, that one either has to reject science to believe in God or reject God to accept science. Because you've taken such an extreme and indefensible position, you've actually deconverted more Christians into atheists than I have. Seriously. The reality is that whether God exists or not is irrelevant. Either way, evolution is a verifiable fact of population genetics, and the Bible is already falsified fables with no truth in it. Not even the existence of your God could change either of these things. I want you to know that I genuinely enjoyed our little exchange more than I thought I could. I listened to your feeble apologetics at the end with your empty promise of the stick and the carrot, neither of which has any possible reality. And having heard that, I think it might be fun to debate theology with you too, since you don't seem to know much about that either. But I want to stick with science and the things I can prove. Religion is too full of nebulous interpretation to be worthy of debate. I am game to do one video like this a month, though preferably a bit shorter than these have been. But unless I get a reasonable response to the last three posts, which I doubt you're even capable of, then I think I'm done with you.